It's Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 16, through to chapter 9, verse 12. Ecclesiastes. I don't think any of us fully realized what we were in for when we started Ecclesiastes, but we're learning a lot from it. And learning that life without Christ is a very miserable business. Chapter 8, verse 16, page 655. Whenever I tried to become wise and learn what goes on in the world, I realized that you could stay awake night and day and never be able to understand what God is doing. However hard you try, you will never find out. Wise men may claim to know, but they don't. I thought long and hard about all this and saw that God controls the actions of wise and righteous men, even their love and their hate. No one knows anything about what lies ahead of him. It makes no difference. The same fate comes to the righteous and the wicked, to the good and the bad, to those who are religious and those who are not, to those who offer sacrifices and those who do not. A good man is no better off than a sinner. A man who takes an oath is no better off than one who does not. One fate comes to all alike, and this is as wrong as anything that happens in this world. As long as people live, their minds are full of evil and madness, and suddenly they die. But anyone who is alive in the world of the living has some hope. A live dog is better off than a dead lion. Yes, the living know they are going to die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward. They are completely forgotten. Their loves, their hates, their passions all died with them. They will never again take part in anything that happens in this world. Go ahead. Eat your food and be happy. Drink your wine and be cheerful. It's all right with God. Always look happy and cheerful, enjoy life with the woman you love, as long as you live the useless life that God has given you in this world. Enjoy every useless day of it, because that is all you will get for all your trouble. Work hard at whatever you do, because there will be no action, no thought, no knowledge, no wisdom in the world of the dead, and that is where you are going. I realized another thing, that in this world fast runners do not always win the race, and the brave do not always win the battle. Wise men do not always earn a living, intelligent men do not always get rich, and capable men do not always rise to high positions. Bad luck happens to everyone. You never know when your time is coming. Like birds suddenly caught in a trap, like fish caught in a net, we are trapped at some evil moment when we least expect it. And quite frankly, if we didn't know Jesus Christ, we would have to agree with every word of that. Praise God, we don't have to agree because we know Jesus. Now you'll remember that in chapter 7 we read that it is better to attend funerals than festivals because the living should always remind themselves that death is waiting for us all. And we've just read now that no one knows when that day will come to him. Quite unexpectedly it can happen. I began preparing this sermon on Tuesday morning and I thought we're going to have to look at death very honestly we're going to have to ask some big questions about it. I didn't know then that it was going to invade our own family circle very shortly afterwards. My wife is not here because her father died a day or two ago and we shall be in Lincolnshire for the funeral tomorrow. And it's good to have these reminders to be brought up short and to be reminded that nobody's here forever and no family circle is secure and that death is the greatest fact of life. And therefore this reading I have encapsulated in a single question and that is if we're going to die tomorrow what shall we do today? And you know what the answer is? 
The answer is that depends on what happens the day after tomorrow. Now that's the question and that's the answer. Let me repeat it so you've got it. If we're going to die tomorrow, what shall we do today? And the answer is that depends on what happens the day after tomorrow. Or to put it in a very different way, what we believe about life after death decides how we behave during life before death. Are you with me? It's what we believe beyond the grave that is going to decide what we do with our time this side of it. And this really highlights, this reading highlights the fact which you may not have realized before so forcefully that the Old Testament says hardly anything about life after death. Had that ever struck you? You try and think of clear teaching in the Old Testament about what lies beyond the grave and you're up against a real problem. Now it isn't that they didn't believe in life after death in that age. They did. I was fascinated to study the excavations of Tutankhamun's tomb when some of the treasures found within it were brought to London and to see how they really believed that Tutankhamun would need furniture and chariots and clothes and gold and would in fact need his body beyond the grave so they preserved it as best they knew how. They really believed that there was a life beyond and that he would need all those goods for it and so they put those things in that tomb and what to me was so pathetic was that when they opened the tomb they were all there covered in dust unused. Now it is against that background that the Old Testament was written. In Egypt, in Babylon, people believed very clearly in life after death. They buried things in the grave for people to use the other side of death. But the Jews didn't talk like that. They were different. They were, I believe, more honest. They faced the facts. And so they used all the euphemisms which we use. We don't like to say so-and-so died. We say they've fallen asleep. And, and the Hebrews used that euphemism. They said he died and slept with his fathers. They didn't give any indication as to whether he was going to wake up from that sleep, whether he was conscious, semi-conscious, or unconscious. There's just a blank. In fact, the more they thought about it, the more they came to the conclusion that the dead were not conscious and were not active, and that if their spirits survived the separation from their bodies, then their spirits floated on in some vague existence to which they gave the term Sheol. That's the Hebrew word in Greek, Hades, the world of the dead. And I've heard it best described by an Old Testament scholar in Cambridge as a kind of station waiting room with no trains coming where spirits just wait, doing nothing, saying nothing, thinking nothing. And in the Psalms it comes out, we read Psalm 30, will it help you God if I go down to the world of the dead? Do the dead praise you? Can the dead give you anything? Then you saved me and I can praise you and I praise you for it that you didn't let me go down to the world of the dead where nothing can happen. And you know Ecclesiastes has this very somber view of death. He says, they don't have any love, they don't have any hate, they don't have any passion. All these things died with them. Work hard at whatever you do because there will be no action, no thought, no knowledge, no wisdom in the world of the dead. And Ecclesiastes is going strictly on scientific observation. As far as we can see, to die is to cease to exist. As far as we can see, it is oblivion. As far as we can see, that is the end of a person. And they are out of the scene of activity. They are off the stage and they will soon be forgotten. Now that's being utterly honest. I believe the Jews were more honest than the Egyptians. The Jews faced facts and they said, as far as we can see, it's better to face the fact that we've got to find God in this life, we've got to enjoy God in this life, because once you get to the end of it, you get to the end of praise and of prayer, you get to the end of thought, of action, of wisdom, your little light goes out. 
And this is why they desperately tried to work out God's providence within this life. They desperately tried to say, if God is a moral God, then it's this life where reward and punishment must take place. Because everybody finishes in the grave the same way. Therefore, if God is a moral God, if this is a moral universe, then the righteous have to be rewarded here and now. And the evil have to be punished here and now. But when they looked at the here and now, that did not seem to happen. And this is the great dilemma, the great enigma of life, which Ecclesiastes highlights. Starting from this premise that death is the end and there is no conscious life for the individual beyond it, he said, let's try and work out what God does here. Let's try and see the pattern of his providence here. Let's see what he rewards here. Let's see what he punishes here. And he came to the conclusion that nobody can answer that question. That even if you stayed awake all night and thought and thought and thought and teased this subject round in your mind and said, on what principles does God operate within this life? You would have to come to the conclusion, I don't know. And the worst thing he says here, unfortunately, doesn't come out too clearly in the translation I read. But the worst conclusion he came to was this, that if there is nothing beyond death and you ask what kind of a God can you see active and operating in this life, he had to say, I do not even know whether God loves me or hates me. I cannot tell from my experience of life whether the power up there who created me likes me or dislikes me. I cannot tell whether he wants to do me good or do me harm. I cannot tell whether he's well disposed or ill disposed towards me. And so he was left with this horrible, empty view of life. And if you do not believe in life after death, this is the only conclusion you can come to, that we do not know whether God loves us or hates us. We do not know if the things that we think should matter to God really do because he seems indifferent to them. If God really is a good God, then he would see that the innocent do not suffer. He would see that the wicked do. He would see that a good deed is rewarded. He would see that an evil deed is not rewarded but punished. He would see that honesty and chastity paid and he would see that dishonesty and unchast unchastity did not pay. He would see to that, but he doesn't. And in this life, we are left with this question, does God love us or hate us? It's a depressing picture, but it's a very realistic one. And we must face it honestly before we move on to the good news of Jesus Christ. He goes so far as to say that the poorest living creature is better off than the finest dead one. And a dog was the most despised animal in the Middle East. They didn't keep them as pets, they were wild scavengers. And yet he said a living dog is better off than a dead lion, the finest creature of the jungle, the king of the beasts. But once a lion is dead, then a living dog is better off. The living at least know they're going to die, but the dead know nothing. Now these are huge statements. They've been echoed in the human heart ever since. A man called Lessing went to visit Egypt and he stood in front of the Sphinx. You know that great creature they dug out of the sand with that very strange Mona Lisa expression? And you're supposed to be able to go and ask it questions. And a man called Lessing said when he stood in front of the Sphinx, he wanted to ask one question of it and one only. He wanted to ask, is this a friendly universe? And Dick Shepard, whom some of you older people may remember from World War I days, Dick Shepard from St. Martin's in the Field said he once stood on a dark starlit night all alone and he stood in the darkness and he wanted to shout up into the darkness, friend or foe, friend or foe, am I in the hands of a God who is favorable towards me or antagonistic? friend or foe, who goes there? Are you for me or against me? And when life has battered you about a bit, you sometimes wonder about that question. You sometimes ask it from the depths of your hearts. Does God love me or hate me? Is he really trying to help me to be good? Because it doesn't seem to be paying right now. 
That's an honest question. You see, honesty is not the best policy in a dishonest world. It should be in a moral universe and with a friendly good God, but it isn't. And so Ecclesiastes says, what's the point of being religious? What's the point of being good? We all finish up the same place, or as the grave digger said to a visitor looking round a churchyard, I get them all in the end, he says. I get them all in the end. The visitor wanted to reply, ah, but it will get you too in the end. Is that all that's got to be said? What then can we do with life if that's all? And Ecclesiastes is nothing if not positive, and the Jews managed to live for centuries without a clear view of life after death. How did they do it? They did it by affirming life. They did it with that toast which we have used here at a communion service, l'chaim, which means to life. And if you've seen Fiddler on the Roof, you've seen a marvelous picture of how Jewish life weighed down with the suffering that could come tomorrow. Nevertheless, affirmed life while it could, drank to life, enjoyed life, made the most of every passing opportunity to enjoy what God had given. And this was the practical philosophy, and it is the best one for those who don't believe in life after death. If you believe that death is oblivion, if you believe that when someone dies, that is the last you will see of them, that is the last time you will speak to them, if you believe that, then the very best thing you can do is to seize every opportunity you can to enjoy life, to enjoy every blessing, because you won't have it too long. So enjoy it now. And just before Christmas, it may be appropriate to read, go ahead, eat your food and be happy. Drink your wine and be cheerful. It's all right with God. And the Hebrews believed it was all right with God. And I want to say it is all right with God. He has given us all things freely to enjoy. And it is right to enjoy them. God didn't want us to be in a lovely, beautiful world that he made and be miserable. He wanted us to seize life. He wanted us to have these things. And so he says, go ahead, be cheerful, enjoy yourself, cheer yourself up, cheer other people up. Do it because tomorrow you're going to die. Work hard because you're more likely to be cheerful if you're working hard than if you have nothing to do. And that's certainly true. Go ahead, he says, enjoy life. That's all right with God. And it is. But if that's all that God had to say to us, do you think we could go on enjoying life? Do you think we could really enjoy life if that's all that God had said? If God had remained hidden from us and if God had so hidden his providential principles that no one could say what he's on about and what he's trying to do with us and what he made the world for, if all we could say was, well, let's enjoy ourselves because we're quite sure that God wanted us to do that, is that enough? I remember reading an illustration in one book written by a preacher in which he said, I want you to imagine that a lot of people went on a cruise in the Pacific Ocean. They got on board a luxury liner and they had everything they could ask for. They had the most gorgeous food. They danced every night. They had a party every night. They swam all day. They sunbathed. They had so much. They had all this. And they were enjoying themselves thoroughly until the captain came on the tannoy and he said over the tannoy, Ladies and gentlemen, I've got great news for you. This ship is going nowhere. You can go on enjoying every day as long as you like. We're just going to circle the Pacific Ocean so that you can go on enjoying yourself. From that day, people began to be miserable. From that day, they began to lose the enjoyment of the cruise. From that day, you could see people sitting around deck with long faces. You see, you can't ultimately enjoy even the good things God has given you unless there's some sense of purpose, unless you have some idea as to what God's doing and what he's after and what his providence is preparing you for and whether you're going somewhere or not. And there is within us this tension. All right, let's enjoy ourselves because death is oblivion and somehow we cannot live with that thought Somehow we've got to press through. Somehow we've got to try and find some further truth about life after death. But Ecclesiastes hasn't got it. And he just never got through. 
but when Jesus Christ came, he altered the whole scene. Do you know, by the time Jesus was born, there were two sorts of Jew. They'd already divided into at least two denominations. This happens to all religions. And the two denominations were Pharisees and Sadducees, and the big argument between them was whether there was life after death. As far as we can tell, the beginnings of belief in life after death came when they went into exile in Babylon and mixed with the Zoroastrian religion and began to realize that other people had a strong view of life after death. And from exile there came back Jews who said this must be true, there must be life after death. And they became known as the Pharisees. And I told you the other night how I used to remember the difference at school when I had to face an exam in scripture knowledge. Incidentally, I was bottom of scripture at school and it shows that the Lord can do wonderful things but I always remembered it because Pharisee was far I see and they were the group that believed in life after death whereas Sadducees were Sadducee because they didn't and I'd got it all off pet well now it was into that situation that Jesus came and the official party was the Sadducee party who did not believe in life after death the Pharisees had begun to and the great arguments went on between these two groups and they tried to see which side Jesus was going to be on in this great argument and the Sadducees came to him one day and told him about someone who'd lost their partner seven times and who were they going to be married to if there was to be a resurrection and wasn't there going to be an awful mix up in heaven when they all got together again and they were laughing you see at the idea of life after death and Jesus came out very, very clearly on the Pharisees' side of the argument. And he told them that if they searched the scripture carefully, very carefully, they would get their answer. And in fact, when you search the Old Testament very carefully indeed, you find just little glimpses. They're only tiny glimpses. But there are tiny little glimpses of a life after death. Just tiny ones. But they're there. There is the confidence that Job had, yet in my flesh I will see God. A leap of faith, but it was there. You find it also in the psalmist when he was wrestling with the problem of the innocent suffering and the wicked escaping. And then he recognized what their end was. And he said that you will guide me with your counsel and afterward, afterward you'll receive me into glory. There's a little glimpse there. And you can find maybe a couple of dozen glimpses, no more, through the Old Testament. Tiny little chinks of light, as if a door was just slightly ajar, and you could see through it into something very beautiful and glorious just beyond. But when Jesus came, he flung the door wide open. And let us say first that Jesus taught unmistakably that the dead survive with conscious life and memory. Can you realize what a shock that was to the Jews? But Jesus taught absolutely clearly that five minutes after you are dead, you will be conscious. You will know that you have survived. Left us in no doubt whatever about that. In his parables, he mentions it. But above all in his life, do you know that he said, why do we call God the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob? Why does he say, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, instead of saying, I was the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob? And Jesus says, I'll tell you, because Abraham, Isaac and Jacob are still around. That's why. And he is still their God. On the top of the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus spoke with Moses and Elijah and they'd been dead and gone for centuries but he talked with them he chatted with them about his cross and his death and the exodus he was going to accomplish in Jerusalem and so again and again Jesus made it quite clear that people who have died are conscious and can talk and can have relationships and above all there is the glorious truth that he raised the dead and so when they came to the grave of Lazarus he spoke to a dead body and he says Lazarus come out of there and Lazarus came out he did it with the widow of Nain's son Jairus' daughter 
And you know, it's interesting that it was the Sadducees put Jesus in the grave. It was the Sadducees sealed the tomb. And they said, that's it. There is no life after death. We're finished with him. He's in that tomb. He's dead and he's gone. And we've dealt with him. And we'll never hear any more of him. It's over. It's finished. The Sadducees didn't believe in life after death. But three days later, that stone was rolled away and Jesus was back again. Furthermore, he has revealed to us in his word the most astonishing thing, that during the three days his body lay in that grave. Do you know what Jesus was doing? Do you think he was asleep and unconscious? Do you know what he was doing? He was preaching. And he was preaching to the people who had been drowned in Noah's flood. It's one of the most extraordinary little touches in the New Testament, that between his death and resurrection, Jesus was preaching to people who had been dead for centuries drowned in the days of Noah. And so we get this tremendous sense that someone who is dead is conscious, active, relating. It's like a breakthrough in thinking about life after death. For the first time it's based not on speculation, it's not based on embalming bodies or putting furniture into graves, it's based on an empty tomb and someone who came back and who was the same person. Survival after death is the first clear thing that we must get into our minds when we listen to Jesus. His words and his works make it absolutely clear that death is not the end of conscious life. Now the second thing that Jesus made clear is this, that life beyond death is a life that has been unmixed. Now let me tell you what I mean. In this world we have a mixture of light and darkness. We have a mixture of life and death. We have a mixture of disease and health. We have a mixture of ugliness and beauty. One thing is absolutely clear. In Jesus' teaching after death, life is unmixed. There are two kinds of life after death and only two and light is on one side and darkness is on the other. Health is on one side, disease is on the other. Beauty is on one side and ugliness is on the other. Life is on one side and death is on the other. And he made it quite clear that life after death was not going to be in a mixed world anymore. That at last there would be a good world and an evil world and not a mixture. That will answer a lot of questions. In fact, it, there won't be the questions raised in that situation. At last, there will be a world in which God can be clearly seen as a good God, as a God who is light, as a God who is love, a world in which there will be no hate, no pride, no envy, no anger, no lust, None of the things that spoil this world and that spoil the very best of us, but a world in which these things have been separated and between them a great gulf so that they cannot ever get mixed up again. That's the second thing that I get very clearly from Jesus Christ. And the third thing I get is this, that God in his providential care this is the pattern on which he's working, that he is not going to separate these things in this world, he is going to separate them in the next, and that it is in the next life that right will be, wrongs will be put right. It is in the next life that evil will be punished and good rewarded. It is beyond the grave that God will do these things. And you may say to me, well, why has God chosen to do it there and not here? Why does God leave us in a mixed situation? Why does he not sort it out here? The answer is so obvious if you just think. If good were rewarded in this life, if evil were immediately punished in this life, do you know you wouldn't be able to get into the Millmead Center for the Cues? God would force us to be good, would he not? There would be no choice. If as soon as you did wrong, you were filled with disease, and as soon as you did right, you got perfect health, would you not do right immediately? Of course you would. You'd be forced to. There would be no choice about it. No faith needed. No trust. No freedom. 
But because we are in a mixed up world in which it does not pay to be good, you can choose to be good. Somebody has said honesty may be the best policy, but if it's the best policy, it's not honesty. And you live in a world in which you can choose to be honest. Because if it always paid, you wouldn't choose. Do you follow me? A mixed up world in which good does not always pay and evil can pay off. And indeed in this country, crime does pay now. Because just over 60% of the crimes in this country are not now detected. So it pays you to be a burglar now. You stand a better chance of getting away with it now. In that situation, you can choose to be honest. You can choose not to steal because that is good and right. And you can choose that right way by faith, believing that it will be rewarded, but not here. This will save you from the disillusion that comes to many who say, I've been so good and, and look what's happened to me. I've tried to live a decent life. I think the most amusing situation that, that ever occurred to me was when I went hospital visiting and I, I met a man and he was in his mid-90s. I believe he was coming up to 96. And it, he realized I was a minister and he said, I've got a problem about God. And I said, what's the problem? He said, well, I just cannot believe in a good God. And I said, why not? Well, he said, what am I doing here in hospital? He said, I, I lived a decent life. I've, I've tried to I've kept myself and, and looked after myself and I've looked after other people and, and he went through all this. I said, just a moment, have you never been in hospital before? He said, never. I said, have you never been ill before? He said, never. He said, why is God letting this happen to me? At 96. And, and 10 days later, he was out of that hospital and on his feet. But you know, he just got his ideas all mixed up. God has not made this world a world in which goodness pays. He's made this world a world in which you may freely choose to be good. And he has said, great is your reward in heaven. And that'll see if you're really good, won't it? That'll see if you trust that there's a good God. That gives you the opportunity to have faith that God will put wrongs right. And so that's the third thing that Jesus made quite clear. First, the survival of the individual in conscious relationship and activity. Second, two worlds, not one, but two, one of which is beautiful beyond description, marvelous beyond imagination, light, love, everything is in that world, and another world which is dark and horrible and hateful. Now comes the big question, which world do you get into? Well, the answer is very simple. If you're good, you'll get into the good one, and if you're bad, you'll get into the bad one. Does that settle it? Not quite, does it? I wish it were that simple. I've told you before of the intriguing interviews we had with boy entrants when they joined the Royal Air Force, and as chaplain I had to meet them. And I remember I used to say, you know, how many Methodists here, how many Baptists, how many brethren, how many agnostics, how many atheists, how many Christians? Consternation. They would look at each other and no hands would go up and I'd say, come on, how many Christians are there here? Occasionally a hand would go straight up. But you know, they didn't mind saying they were Methodists or Baptists or anything else, but when you said, how many Christians? It's real consternation. So I said, come on, how many Christians? Well, what do you mean, Padre? And I said, well, what do you mean? And they would say, well, somebody who keeps the Ten Commandments. That was always the first answer. Okay, that's fine. Somebody who keeps the Ten Commandments. How many Christians are there here? Consternation again. <laughs> These hands going up and down. Well, nobody can keep them all, Padre. Okay, how many do you have to keep? Six out of ten. That was invariably the proportion there, pass mark. Fine, I said. Six out of ten. How many Christians are there here? Still hesitation. How good do you have to be to get into that good world, Jesus? How good do you have to be? And Jesus says, well, you don't have to be good enough to be good in your own judgment, nor good enough to be good in other people's judgment. There's only one thing, you need to be good enough in God's sight. That's all. And that closes the kingdom of heaven to me so tightly. 
I reckon I could be good enough in my own sight, provided I was fairly tolerant with myself and lenient and excused certain things. I reckon I might just get away with it and be good enough in some other people's sight, not those who know me well, but some people I might get away with. But to be good enough in God's sight, when you consider what his pass mark is, it's 10 out of 10. Do you realize that if God allowed you in, into heaven as you are, it would certainly spoil it for everybody else? Let that sink in. There's enough anger or pride or envy in you to spoil heaven. And Jesus said that place is going to be good. It's going to be really good. It's going to be really clean. It's going to be really lovely. And if you're really good and clean and lovely, you can go there. But you're not going there if you're going to spoil it. And I'm afraid the sad truth is that if any of us went as we are, we'd spoil it. Would you not agree? And it would be hell for some people to live with me forever as I am. It wouldn't be heaven. And so we're left with this terrible impasse. I thought it was good news that Jesus brought. I thought he was going to bring life and immortality to light. I thought he was going to tell us that there was a wonderful life waiting all of us beyond the grave. Now he's told us that the conditions for that good life are such that none of us stand a chance of getting there. So what do we do now? Let's go back to Ecclesiastes. He asked the question, is it love or is it hate? Friend or foe? Is this a friendly universe? Is the God up there favorably disposed towards me or not? That's the question. And the answer comes from the lips of Jesus. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That word perish came home to me so forcibly when I realized that it meant exactly what it said. If you've had a hot water bottle perish, you know what's happened to it. It hasn't ceased to exist. It has simply ceased to be able to be used for the purpose for which it was made. It's still there, but it's useless. And a man who has perished hasn't gone into oblivion. He has just become useless for the purpose for which God made him. And when God made man, he made us to bear his image and reflect his glory and be his sons and love him and love one another. That's what he made us for. And when a man perishes, he has reached the point where he can no longer contain love. Where he can no longer be the kind of person that God wanted him to be. That's hell. And Jesus, who was the only one in the Bible who really talked about hell, spoke of it in terms of such horror that he said it would be better for you to pull your eyes out or cut your hand off than go to that place. It's a place where people have become useless for love. It's a place where they've perished as human beings. It's a place where they've just gone rotten, where they stink. And God so loved the world that he wanted nobody to land up in that place. How on earth then could he take me as I am and put me in a world where my sin would spoil it? Well, there's only one way, and that was he had to deal with that sin. He had to get it out of my life. How could he do that? Well, you know the story. He did it first by sending Jesus to a cross. And if Ecclesiastes couldn't see God's plan in this world, the day that Jesus died was surely the supreme example of this great conundrum. Why do the innocent suffer and the guilty go scot-free? And as you look at that scene and say, where is God in this? What does God think he's doing? Here is the only perfect life that's ever been lived. Here is the one life that deserved to be rewarded. And what does it get? A cross. There's no sense. There's no rhyme. There's no reason in this. And Ecclesiastes' perplexity comes to a peak at Calvary. And you say, God, what do you think you're doing? This is a mad world. It's not a moral world, if that kind of thing can happen in it. But God knew what he was doing. 
God let it happen so that an innocent person might suffer on behalf of the guilty. Ever since then, we've known that we need not question God's providence. We need not say, why did you let this happen? God knows what he's doing. And that day when injustice was at its worst and when an innocent, perfect life was being cruelly, painfully done to death, God was achieving what he wanted. He was making it possible for John David Pawson to go and live in a lovely world beyond the grave. He was making it possible for my sins to get forgiven. He was making it possible then by raising that Jesus from the dead and giving him back to me. Making it possible for me to be fit enough to go and to begin a work in my heart that will go on until it's complete and until he's got me fit. That's what it was all about. And so I know what God is doing. Dear old Ecclesiastes lying on his bed awake day and night and teasing his mind. Lord, what are you doing in this world? I can't see what you're doing. I know what God is doing. He's bringing many sons to glory. That's what he's doing. He's preparing people for another world. That's what he's doing. He's making people fit to live with him in glory. That's what he's doing. He's letting us go through the mill. He's letting us face suffering. He's letting us face the good and the bad. Because all things are working together for good to those who love him. It's his school and school can be tough. But I know what he's doing. He has revealed it. So I now know the answer. Is it love or hate? The answer is it's love. Lord, do you know what you're doing in this mess we call planet Earth? Yes, says God, I know what I'm doing. I'm preparing you for somewhere else that is far beyond anything you've ever seen or heard or imagined. It's a new world. Right, if Ecclesiastes says there is nothing after death, so the best thing you can do is enjoy yourself. Eat your food, drink your wine. Christian says, ah, but there's something more. Every moment this Christmas is going to be a choice that will have eternal significance. Over this Christmas, I am preparing for another celebration. This week will bring me one week nearer to heaven, and therefore should bring me one week nearer to being fit to go there. And so it's not just enjoy yourself now. If we're going to die tomorrow, what shall we do today? Well, that depends on the day after tomorrow. And if the day after tomorrow is heaven, then today must be the preparation for it. It can still affirm life. It can still enjoy all that God gives. It can still say, look, Haim. But instead of just saying to life, it says to eternal life, to eternal life. So the quartet are going to come out and sing for us right now. They're going to sing about that moment when in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed and prepared finally with new bodies for a new life after death and a resurrection that will be eternal. Oh, that will be glory. Glory. Poor old Ecclesiastes, once again we're sorry for you being born too soon before Jesus brought life and immortality to light through the gospel and through his resurrection gave us a living hope that enables me to attend that funeral tomorrow afternoon up there in Lincolnshire and to say that is not the end. It's not the last word. They may screw the coffin lid down as they seal the tomb. But hallelujah, he arose. Let's listen to the quartet. Lord Jesus, since you died and rose again, it isn't such a terrible thing to die after all. We thank you for drawing the sting of death away and giving us an eager expectancy. Lord, we can really say we look forward to departing and being with you for it's far better and we praise you that only you could give us this hope 
as a certainty for the future. So Lord, none of us knows who will be the next one in this congregation to die. But we rejoice that those who die in the Lord are raised from the dead. And enjoy a conscious communion with yourself immediately and are looked after by the angels as soon as we cease to look after them. And we praise you for this sure and certain hope brought to us by your resurrection from the dead. And oh, what a miracle is going to take place in that moment in the twinkling of an eye. New bodies that will never grow old and die, never be tired or diseased, bodies that can serve you day and night. Lord, by faith we're halfway there already. Teach us then over this Christmas time to rejoice together, to take all the gifts that you give us with thanks, and a firm life that you intended it to be a joyful thing. But we thank you too for the sad moments. We thank you too for the difficulties. We praise you that you know what you're doing and that you're putting us through school. Grant that we may not fail our finals. When the call comes, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen.